Welcome to Rum 101 with Black Top Rum. My name is Mitch Wilson. I'm the global ambassador for Black Top Rum. And each day this week during Whiskey Show, we're going to be introducing you to some of the delights of the rum world. Um, we're going to be looking at different topics each day, answering different questions, answering your questions in the chat as well. Um, so anything you want to know about rum, hopefully within this week, uh, we're going to cover some of those topics for you. And we're also going to put these videos up as a resource on our Black Tot YouTube channel so that if you're getting into rum for the first time yourself or you've got a friend uh, who's getting into rum for the first time and you want to get them on the right path or give them a good introduction, hopefully these videos will be a little help. So I have uh, a couple of jo guests joining me today. Uh, my first guest, which I'm going to introduce, is the wonderful Anya Rubin from The Tropic Topic. And uh, she may be joined as well by her partner, Joe Farr. So just give it a second for the video to come up. Hello. Hi, Anya. How are you? Hey, guys. I'm very good. Bit warm, but not nice and cosy. How are we? I'm very well. I'm very jealous of your fireplace and your 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 flaming pineapple neon light. I mean, that's all of the things I want to happen with the pineapple. Yes, <laughs> fantastic. Um, and also joining us today, we have the amazing Dean McGregor from Speciality Brands, rum expert extraordinaire. Woo! Welcome, Dean. Hey, hey, that's quite the intro. Thank you. <laughs> And what a chef, Dean. Well, I thought I had to represent. There's some big guests on this uh, channel, so I thought I'd go big, go bold. <laughs> Fantastic. But I think mine's quite cool as well, so. Yeah. Have you customised yours, Anya? Has yours had a little, you've had a little cut off? Or? It's actually massive. So. <laughs> it's, it's a sleep I, set. I, <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> Um, wonderful. So yeah, so we've got some wonderful shirts represented. We've got the uh, the We Rum the City from Trailer Happiness, my favourite rum bar, um, and we've got Dean wearing it's the Claren Casimir. You said yes. The, uh, yeah, I've got the Casimir today. I've got yeah. amazing. So I thought the red would, would fit, and it's nice to get like some Trailer alumni on the on the, <laughs> on the yeah, group. absolutely. We've got Serge in the in the background as well, being our little revolutionary voyeur. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've got some people coming on to join us as well. So, um, so yeah, so as, as I mentioned, you know, the, the premise of this week is for us to, uh, you know, hopefully introduce the rum world a little to, to whiskey lovers out there and to convert some over. <laughs> Revolutionary Poyo has said his new business card. I love it. Um, <laughs> but we want to we want to show and we want to explain and help answer some of the questions that um that often come, uh when when people are first coming into the rum world because there is so much uh famously so much misinformation uh so much disinformation so much just pure nonsense out there um and i think it can be it can be pretty daunting when someone's first coming in because we don't have some of this clear cut lines sometimes uh that allow people to distinguish one one from another and different different types uh we've got brian joining us from phoenix in arizona where it's like probably about 4 a.m <laughs> so we've got some guests from all around the world today um question is still up or just getting up that's the yeah. <laughs> Party hard, Brian. Um, <laughs> but to, to start off with, um, Anya, I'd love you to uh, just introduce yourself, a little bit of your background, how you got into rum and uh, and what you're doing now as well. Well, right now? No. <laughs> um, well, my journey is actually quite funny, though, uh, in terms of, like, I was, you know, back in the day, I was like, this innocent Swiss girl, not knowing about who's got, like, because my country is more about... Uh, Aperitifs and beers and stuff. Um, I left my country when I was like 1920 and uh, went over to London, started off as a nanny. Um, you know, that was quite okay, but it didn't really, didn't really was the thing for me in terms of like the families where, you know, that you live with families and everything. Never mind. Um, but yeah, 
we, we can get into these, you know. We can. <laughs> this okay. can be therapy as well, you know. <laughs> Interesting part. Um, but basically, I've quit my job there, and so I was like, I really want to stay in London, and you know, it's very interesting for me here. And I actually stumbled across uh, Rum Kitchen, and yep. uh, I found no no one else uh, apart from you there, Mitch. Uh, you know, this is how we got introduced to each other the first time ever. And I was like, listen, I'm looking for a job. Uh, I don't really care what it is if I need to clean toilets or whatever. <laughs> So I, I started off as a kitchen porter. Yeah. And like many years later, I basically done like every single job in rum kitchen, from bar back to waitress to everything, uh, until I became a bartender. And this is how my rum journey started, really. And from there, I went to many other bars, bars, uh, bar openings, and everything. Uh, yeah. It's amazing, yeah. Because I I remember I I hadn't started much before before you there, and um, I remember yeah you were a KP and I I was bar backing there. This was in the days when Alex Mazuris and Mario were running the bar, and uh, being a bar back for Alex Mazuris is one of the the wildest experiences you can ever imagine like you learn pretty fucking quick <laughs> it's like you know you know when you've done wrong and you know when you're getting shots you've done okay so it's um, a wild ride but I, I remember uh, you know uh, shortly after sort of going away coming back and then you were like bartending and then going away coming back and you were like at trailer and it was like every time I came back you just like jumped up you know 10 more rungs on the on the bar ladder so it's uh it's been amazing to to see your progress from our early days so and um uh dean as well um i'd love to, to hear your rum back name the rum expert for speciality um by the way i, I might just i'm uh, there's some a bit of feedback on some of the speakers so if i mute you i'm not trying to cut you out the oh, conversation no, no, I'm taking any... <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, uh, I started off uh, in Reading, actually, um, this little bar called Sahara, uh, closed about seven, eight years ago now. Uh, but everyone was really, it was kind of like, like, we like to think like the hub of Reading for a very, very long time before Milk Bar took over, which is amazing in the town, if you're ever in Reading. Uh, everyone was more into their whiskey, but I kind of just, I don't know, when I just, Kind of was drawn to rum the stories the different islands the diversity the flavors the stories uh and all the romance and everything and i really and so when that closed i moved over to trailer so i took the punt to commute from reading to trailer happiness and sleep on many people's couches for a good year or so <laughs> that's where i met anya she was working around the corner kept popping in uh so the, obviously trailer it's a nice little mecca you learn learn so much open the world to me a lot more then I got the opportunity to work for Love Drinks and uh, El Dorado brand ambassador for the UK. So one of my favorite brands that got me into the rum, that and Mount Gay were the first sort of rums that really sort of got me like, ooh, this is, this is yeah. somewhere. This is interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. There, uh, two years ago, I started with speciality. Uh, and again, far, far, uh, far wider spectrum, a lot more learning, a lot more, get to visit a lot more places. A lot more new interesting things yeah it's great like keeps me busy keeps my mind ticking over so much interesting <laughs> yeah meet people's community as well is incredible yeah it's it's funny and it's amazing as well like we talk of i mean trailer obviously being one of the world's great run bars but it's amazing how many people have come come through the ranks there and like yeah. it feels it feels like even if you uh, even if they're for a short time or a long time whatever it just it just railroads the whole career into rum. <laughs> it's like, it always sticks with you. You know, it's one big family, and like the people they really stayed there for a bit longer than, let's just say, a month or a few. Um, as I say, we always go back there. We always, like, you know, we meet each other when we have drinks and stuff. I think this is, it's a really strong bond. Like, it's something very special. Yeah. Yeah, I get um, regularly taken the piss out of by uh, by Chanel because she she will like start a timer after each session. It's like how long till Mitch mentions trailer. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's a, it's a wonderful place. And if if you're watching from around the world, if ever you visit London, like you have you have to go there. It's 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 one of the homes 
of rum in the world. So, um, and Serge, who's watching, I know is uh, is having run the bar there as well. And uh, yeah, the whole team there is just amazing. So, um, so let's get into it. Um, there's, there's there's a couple of different areas which I wanted to cover today. The the original premise of this session uh, was called "What is Tropical Aging and Why the Hell Should I Care." Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that to start with, and then, um, uh, but also because because of your your backgrounds and because of of where we've all worked as well, I thought it'd be great to talk about um, cocktails and rum blends and, and get into you know uh, for a lot of people who might be either making drinks at home or sort of might only think rum is just for cocktails or just just for sipping or, or whatever it is, trying to give them a bridge into to how both worlds can be amazing um hello nathan hi welcome so um so what what is tropical aging why the hell should i care this is this is a common question which comes up uh maybe not worded exactly that way but a common question that comes up amongst whiskey crowds because in whiskey it's like age age is age Oh, did I go? Yeah. No? Still here? Yeah. We can. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there isn't necessarily the same uh, confusion in, in the whiskey world because, yeah, generally where a whiskey's made is where it's aged and the minimum age is the minimum age. It's not a made up number, slow aged, 23 something, whatever. It's just like <laughs> this, this is what it is. Um, so sometimes it can get it can get a little confusing when we're like, oh yeah, this is continentally aged, this is tropical age, this is lower age. This is you know like this this number probably doesn't mean the number you think it means. So, um, so so Dean, maybe if I could get you to to kick this off because you've got uh, a tremendous amount of rums, um, both unaged and tropically aged in in your lineup which you represent. So, what what for you is the the, the key things that you want people to know about tropical aging and, and why they should give a damn. Why they should give a damn. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I, love, I love that little tail end. Like, <laughs> why should we care? We should. <laughs> it's, um, well, it's just so, so different. Uh, you can talk about, I've just uh, got off a call talking about terroir and everything. And it's, uh, it's, it's it's just so exciting because there's such different climates, such different places. Uh, it all makes a huge, huge, huge impact. And it's only, well, I wouldn't say one thing, like most of the Brit British style rums that we would have had over the time, over the years, especially early 18, 17, well, you, you know, more than anyone else, Mitch, would have been aged in London. So yeah. uh, for it to actually be aged in the tropics, just heat being essentially just a massive catalyst for speeding things up good or bad uh in some cases uh you just get more flavor quicker you get more intensity of ester like flavor development again sometimes good sometimes bad it's not always uh, a positive but it's always good to know because you'll have two products which be very very different but regardless and you need to know that information it's it's key it really really is and a lot of people will talk about like that was uh, the equivalent of a 25 year old over in eight, only in eight years. Uh, in some ways, yes. In other ways, in other ways, no. There's, like you say, there's lots and lots of different myths uh, and things. But yeah, the, the overall flavor profile, your yield at the end as well is quite important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, so just to put this in perspective for any whiskey whiskey people that might be watching, so. I'm, um, I currently, uh, I'm, I'm building, I'm trying to build a, uh, climatic table of, uh, highs and low temperature for everywhere across the Caribbean and corresponding humidities and everything else going on, uh, because I'm uh, really bored. Um, <laughs> <laughs> lockdown. we've all taken lockdowns differently, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, and it, and it is, it's fascinating when you start to like map out the Caribbean with, with some of these numbers and, and like the coolest average across the year anywhere in the Caribbean is about 21 degrees, um, you know, and going up to about 
31 degrees. Now you might have extremes obviously out of that from, from time to time, but, but that's the average for the year. You're sitting between 21 and 31 pretty much everywhere. Um, and that's crazy, you know, compare that to aging it in Liverpool or Amsterdam or Scotland or any, or London or any of these places where, where rum historically has been brought to. And, of course, it's a huge, huge difference in terms of what that's going to do to the barrel. Um, you talk about uh, angel share and angel um, and duppy share, devil share. You know, we it's a common that's term. The, that's the angels, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, it's, it's, a, it's a common term in Scots. We, we hear it all the time. And, and typically in Scotland, I think that the sort of agreed average is around, you know, 2 to 3% evaporation from your barrel year on year um what do you what are you finding across across the brand do you represent Dean? what what kind of angel share are you typically expecting well um well nowadays well back uh, when i was speaking to the guys sean caleb from um De el dorado and ddl um when they used to cask in the high 80s they were losing something mad 10 to 14 percent per year <laughs> it's insane uh, especially if you uh, multiply that over 10 years, say, you, there's not much left. Uh, yeah. After a while, they sort of started casking at about 65% or 70% seems to be sort of the average you'd find across the Caribbean. And now they've kind of leveled out around sort of 7, seven to 8%. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. And I've actually got, I thought Sergio would be on... Um, would be on. So I brought this. It's a worthy park, uh, Habitation Bellier. Uh, and they've put... Angel share over 10 years is 64%. So 64% of that. So that's cumulatively over the course of 10 years. Yeah. About 64% of the liquid. Yes. It's insane. <laughs> Imagine, it, like, no wonder we drink unaged rum. Like, why would we? <laughs> <laughs> that's so much good rum that's just gone um and your, what's your what's your experience been like obviously working in bars and and working with rums for cocktails and everything else but like when you know how much does it affect what rums you're selecting to play with or what rums you're recommending to people or do people do you feel people average consumers understand when they're coming up are they specifically asking for the tropical continental changes over the course of like your whole experience your whole time behind the bar like first of all like there are different effects, of course, if we talk about tropical aging, if we talk about continental aging. And also, I think what's really important that we understand there are different human beings out there. Different human beings are different, having different tastes. So at the end of the day as well, like before we even come to a conclusion, what's better, tropical aging, continental aging, what do you prefer, what I prefer, you know, like, is a wide spectrum, as I say, because everyone, like, you know, goes into different ways, has different tastes. Um, I think definitely for people, they do not know much about the history or how even rum is produced or made, or that's what I mean, like not even going into aging. Um, mm. They generally, I think, obviously go for, you know, like these sort of, these sort of rum brands we know, like they have a like really big, marketing thing i mean let's 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 talk um i even forgot the name because i never talk about it <laughs> captain morgan there we go <laughs> you don't know how often i have been asked in trailer happiness in the rum bar like oh do you have captain morgan and i'm like no sorry guys uh, you know we're not stocking that and they're like Oh, well, that's disappointing. What other rums do you have then? <laughs> <laughs> Stand there and you're like, oh, where's my <laughs> and, um, You know, it, it's sad. It hurts you. It's painful. But then also it thrives you to like, then go up to them and be like, okay, fair enough. This is where you come from. You know, this is what you learned. But let me guide you through this amazing world behind my back like you know like mm -hmm. I have everything to offer and like let's just start you know small and and yeah like go go the way up but yeah <laughs> serge asks tropically or continentally spiced captain morgan <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's 
um, it's yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? But this this and and but this is an interesting. We were, we were talk, talking this story last night where you know I I remember being at a run fest uh, a few years back and this guy goes. I've got a run that I think you might like to try. He's like, but you can't prejudge it. I was like, okay, what is it? And he's like, it's Captain Morgan. I was like, okay. He's like, but it's the 73% version from Germany in the 70s where it was 100% long pond distillate. And I was like, oh, <laughs> and we tried it and it was phenomenal, you know, and it's, uh, so may maybe your customer was just asking for that, Anya. Maybe like you know, he was like, "I just want some pure long pond pasta. Why? Why are you laughing at me?" <laughs> I have a really good point as well because, as I say, like you know, the difference between tropical aging and continental aging. Like some some hey, liquids, some liquids need it, and like they turn out really amazing. But then they are the ones they continental aged and. You know they're amazing as well so as i say like it's not like the golden rule if you come from this aging part of this aging part you're going to be better or worse so yeah absolutely we've got um we've got miguel in the chat miguel if you if you are uh, if you're wearing any clothes or even if you're not feel free to join the chat if you want to as well because um <laughs> we'd love to have you on this as well um so yeah, it's it's. <laughs> it's um, no, no, it's 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 such a big part, and it's and it's it, it's interesting that it seems to only really apply to the rum world. There's no no other spirit category where we have this, and you know, as as Dean, as you mentioned, you know, we 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 do have that. We have a precedent set where for two three hundred years, rum was brought to Europe. It was aged here. It was blended here. It was bottled here it was put out and now we're seeing this movement going back to like well let's actually do this all on the islands let's do it in those those places and it's um it's interesting you know because there's obviously the some rums that we um you know logistically if we want to get a hold of it like we have to buy through a broker like you know we we buy um four square five-year-old for black tot and we have to go through EA Shear to get that component. We can't get it directly, you know. And there's my my hope is that over time we'll be able to buy directly from any distillery we want to work with and have those have those channels set up. But at the moment it's like, well, you've got I, I guess it's almost like a it's like having your your supermarket with all of the thousands of items that you want versus your little independent store and something you know you sometimes your choice is more limited so it's of course you want to go and and get all the things you want to get it's it's probably going to take a little bit of time to to set it up differently and and as well you know a lot of these rums which are continentally aged or or go through brokers and blends you know for a lot of distilleries that's a lot of that's a lot of their rum output you know that's a lot of the a lot of the basic there you know and it's it's exciting to me that we're now actually getting to go and see some of the direct bottoms like Hampton would be a, a good example, Dean. And I'd love you to tell us a bit more about, about what they're doing and, and when that first came onto the market. Because uh, again, you know, I think that's a story that uh, most people would, well, there are probably a, quite a lot of whiskey examples lens historically, but have now come to the forefront. So tell us yeah, about Hampton. Like, Hampton's a great example. I was going to mention that. So right. <laughs> good um, yeah, so Hampton Estate uh, has been in continuous production since the mid 1700s, so 1750s. Uh, but a lot of people may not have heard of it because it was mainly sold by bulk rum to Europe and it was put in yeah in blends it was put in perfumes it was used in food food flavorings and things like rum and race and ice cream just for that real high intensity jamaican funkiness high ester flavor uh still to this day actually about i was told it might change now about 80 percent of it goes unaged to europe into blends right and it had never been it had never been aged in jamaica it'd been made there and then just sold under contract however to european brokers and blenders uh, you had the likes of, I think, Murray McDavid probably have some Hamden casks. I know Berry Brothers did, had Caden Head. You'd find, I'm pretty sure, it was, uh, our, well, I just, just before I started with the team, um, they went on a trip to Isla and got stuck in Inverary. Uh, so they got to go visit Springbank, and they found some casks of Hamden and Coronis in the Springbank warehouses. Wow. 
So that was, if you wanted Hamden, that was the only way you could get Hamden for a very, very long time. Until yeah, in 2009, yeah. the Hussey family, a uh, Jamaican family who own Everglade Farms, uh, bought the distillery from auction. And instead of sort of modernizing it, they could have just sort of, all this wild fermentation takes far too long. <laughs> well, if we put all this shiny new equipment in, we can make a lot more clown a lot quicker. Uh, they decided to preserve its present, uh, preserve it, which is an incredible decision to do, and took the punt to actually start investing and in aging their own stock. Um, so 2018, uh, we saw the very first Hamden releases, which were actually aged at the distillery, which is incredible. And uh, last year at the whiskey show, uh, Steph, we did something called Tropical Aging, a small little masterclass just for the specialty brands. So we had uh, Ian Chang from Cavalan, and we actually managed to get hold of a uh, Douglas uh, Hunter Lang Hamden as well, the similar age to our Hamden. And they were just, might be slightly different marks, but it's so yeah. interesting to see the complete difference. They're both eight years old, well, seven to eight years old, 100% aged in, well, I assume, uh, Scotland, maybe a bit of uh, Amsterdam as well, and one aged yeah. in Jamaica. Both fantastic products, but one, the, the tropically aged one, just had a lot of that tropical vibrancies, more of that pineapple notes, whereas the mm -hmm. uh, the one aged in London didn't have that quarter, quarter, kind of that big vibrancy. It's a bit more smoky and a bit more of the sort of high acetone kind of flavors. Considering they could tech almost be the same products, they were holes apart, but both interesting and amazing for their own right. I obviously go with the chocolate one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, this is, uh, have you guys both tried the um, the the bottling that Bellio and Shear did? Uh, was it last year of the MMWs and uh, the EMB? The other EMBs, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the different marks, um, different recipes basically have different acronyms. So that I'm not sure the EMB, I believe it's that as an old. Yeah, we're, we're, we're probably cut, we're, we're stepping ahead of, out of the rum yeah, 101 yeah. era. <laughs> um, yeah. the, the EMB is essentially a recipe. It's, a, it's an acronym for something. Uh, it's how they, yeah. as rums, when they make lots of different recipes, it's how they identify them. That's what you see branded on the casks. But yeah, that was a yeah. fantastic product, wasn't it? A uh, fantastic pro uh, project. I actually got some in my cupboard. Um, oh, man. <laughs> humble brag, that one. Um, <laughs> so uh, Luca Gargano from Velier fame over in Italy, uh, independent, uh, dependent bottler. They source directly from source in the series all across the Caribbean, even sometimes the Indian Ocean, all across the world, Cape Verde, you name it. They probably bottled something from there. Uh, they worked with uh, Ian A. Shear, which Mitch, you know far more about than I do, which is in Amsterdam. It's a huge family-owned rum broker. They've been going for about what, 300 years. Yeah, started late late 1700s um, sometime. <laughs> I'll, I'll get the exact date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they managed to source uh, from a distillery called Money Musk in Jamaica, uh, which is in um, in the south. Uh, casks which had been from the same the same recipe, the same year vintage. At one aged in the distillery and one aged in an Amsterdam. I thought it was incredible they managed to find the same vintage and <laughs> everything, considering that, that this project had not been planned like 50, 10 years ago when it when the, the aging started. Absolutely, and, and that that's what would be really fascinating is to get the exact exact same distillates. Obviously, they're pretty close in terms of them the yeah. marketing recipe, but it'd be amazing to just lay down some barrels and and do some direct comparisons because yeah, it's. Um, Lots of lots of brands are actually putting this up now, you know, like having the same thing, the exact same barrel, and bring them to both uh, different agings to have to com like the comparison one to one. And I think yeah, that's quite fascinating. And it's also going on taking us into a completely different angle of like how we can actually, you know, uh, have it one to one in comparison. Yeah. No, absolutely. Back in the day, we didn't really have that, didn't we? Like we had different brands being from different continents, but you know, not having the one. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think I think for years it, it was you know often not mentioned on the labels. It often wasn't distinguished, you know, and so it was you know it was very hard, as you know, like if you've got a five year old rum or five years where because it is going to completely affect it depending on if that's five years in 
Amsterdam or five years in the Caribbean. Um, and and it's interesting as well, you know, like to use that Bellier and Shea release as, as an example, um, with the 11 years, the tropical for me, like far blew away the continentally aged 11 years. It was just like richer and fuller and had all of those, like all, everything about that run that had come into itself, you know, in the tropically aged 11 year. But then in the 14 year, it was almost like the wood had taken over in the tropics. Like it's almost like it was too tannic, too heavy. And, and I actually found the 14 year continental by contrast was actually the perfect sweet spot for that particular, for that particular blend, you know? So, um, so, so it is interesting. I think, you know, undoubtedly as a, as a blender, having the option of these different flavor profiles and having the option to slow down a rate of aging or, or, or slow down some of that, that loss is, is a fantastic, you know, tool to have. Uh, but then, you know, we need the transparency. We need the distinguishment. So you, so you know, okay, this is ten years there, or ten years here, because it is a very different thing depending on where it is. And and obviously, there's a there's a big, um, probably the biggest argument, and I'd say that the the strongest argument for why we'd have uh, tropical aging is is more money going back to the distillery. You know, them being able to sell the rum at its full worth, if you like, at its full full expense there and, and then making the money rather than that going to a bloke or a broker or a blender. I mean, um, yeah. Do you guys want to add anything to that? Any, any thoughts on that aspect? Well, I think you, you pretty much summed it up uh, as I would say as well, like transparency as much as you can, because I do, we all know like some are just, you know, very defensive what blends you're going for. Like you can't always be transparent, but, as I say, like, yeah, I think it's just like having the, the like the nice middle ground of being as transparent as you can. Mm. You fully understand, okay, this is this and this is that. It's, this also goes back into people are not understanding and not being from our background. Then, you know, having this misinformation and the things they read on the bottle and having automatically assumption, okay, it tells me that on the bottle, so this is it. And again, this is what we don't want. We want to, you know, yeah. yeah. Clear more up about what it's all about and what the background is. So, yeah. Dean? absolutely, Dean. Yeah, I think it's great as well seeing the uh, seeing the distilleries on the island taking more, more sort of ownership over their own products as well. Say, like mm. saying earlier, the, the London Dock Rums. It was rum was more of a commodity. It was made by the distillers. And all of the skill was seen back in the Europeans for the blending. You had all these different tools to make your own blends with. And you started seeing the lemon hearts and everything. Yeah. Lemon hearts uh, all, and things like that emerging. And then you've started seeing the distillery sort of taking ownership as well. Like um, obviously El Dorado, for an example, uh, they started obviously a bulk brand selling to the likes of your woods, your lemon heart demoreras, whenever you see demorera everywhere. And, and then in the 90s, they started releasing their own brands globally and they've been tropically aging them. And um, it's been great to see many, many islands doing that and distillery own, distilleries having their own brands aged. So you have a lot more control over start to finish. That's where the yeah. transparency comes from, which yeah. is amazing. Although it's it quite, it's quite, it's amazing when you find when an independent bottler and they're like, what's in that? Like, I don't know, but it tastes amazing. <laughs> it kind of takes away that mystery. It is incredible, but the traceability and sort of the ownership is great because then, say, as you said, the, the money's going back to the islands as well. Uh, it's not just tourism; people are going there. It's amazing. But again, yeah. I, I do like the air of mystery of just what's this? I don't know. It's a fourteen-year-old Demerara rum that we've come across. Do you know anything yeah. about it? No. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, this That's is cool. um, we we had a because obviously we you know with what we're doing with black top we're trying to be very transparent about blend ratios and breakdowns of all of these kind of things as well and um so i started digging into the the bottling we did of the black top 40 year old because i was like right okay i want to know what these casks did from 1975 when it was distilled up until us putting it in a bottle and it's like 
no one knows. No, <laughs> no, one, no one, no one cared. No one wrote down like, oh yeah, we've aged it for this long here, and then we've moved it to here. We've done because you know those casks changed hands several times over over those years, and um, you know, so it was like we know it was a Port Morant distillate. We know the Port Morant still was at Eiffel Distillery when we when it was distilled. We have no idea how long those casks were there for. We have no idea what time they made it over to Europe. So, so even though we want to give a full full breakdown, it's just like we don't we don't know where the records are. We don't know, you know, and and pretty much the closest we could get is probably if we could find the original receipts of it of those casks changing hands, you know, forty years ago. Then then great, but yeah, it's very very hard. So. They're, they're, they're not going to be on the internet though. They'll be scribbled. <laughs> <laughs> i'm like this isn't on google come on yeah. um, Quill, quilled away somewhere, yeah. <laughs> send matt, matt petrek into a, a library somewhere to go and dig them up <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah no it's 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 an interesting conversation i think it's a, it's, it's a great thing to do and one of the things that um i say what i'm trying to do is build this climatic by the way if anyone knows the one, someone who's already done it i will happily take the <laughs> The shortest path to that if it already exists but um but just having that sort of reference to be able to look at a bow and go okay well it was in this climate it had this humidity it was there for this many years the the likely angel share for that distillery in that part of the island will, will do this like um this is sort of like the next the next level for me of being able to really specify okay this every barrel is going to be slightly different but this gives you a good understanding of what conditions that barrel has specifically been through at that distillery in order to get to where it is today you know? so um so yeah that's that. anyway that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> and you're on the weather channel a lot <laughs> yeah that's <it. laughs> um so i wanted to look at as well uh with you sort of uh now moving more into the drink side and and how we drink it and how we enjoy it and and you know it's for for me i i discovered rum through cocktails and through mixes and and you know growing growing up in essex rum looked like sailor jerry and coke do you know what i mean no one ever thought to drink it on its own thank god um, <laughs> um and then you come to trailer and you're presenting pina coladas and daiquiris and it's a wonderful time um but we are, I think even in the time I've been in the industry, I've seen the shift from, you know, rum just being something for cocktails to more and more people coming and sipping and enjoying meat. And, and but undeniably, you know, bars like Trailer and, and the drinks they make there are, are a wonderful part of it. So, so Anya, you've obviously just started Tropic Topic um, with your partner, Go. To bring my better half in and replace him with uh, the pineapple. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Hello, Joe. Welcome. Hey, Joe. How are you? Um, welcome. Yes. Hello. Welcome. And D Dean, I'm going to say, can you turn down your speaker just a little bit? So I, I don't want to want to mute you. And I, th I think I that might fix it yeah hopefully we'll see we'll see it only seems to be coming from Anya's side but um um but yes welcome joe and and yeah i'd love to hear about what you guys are doing with the tropic topic what the focus is with that and you know it looks like you're making some delicious drinks but because of lockdown we haven't tried any of them in real life yet so i'd love <laughs> you to, to describe the concept to us and, and what you're doing with that absolutely um well maybe i start quickly and then move over to joe um well in general uh, we want to do this for quite a long for quite some time now but i think with everything happened with lockdown and everything uh it was it was just the right moment for us to be like okay we have time now we can do this like we literally you know because the thing for us is if we do things we don't do them halfway like we fully go yeah. And um, as I say, we just came like to the assumption, like, yeah, like we literally have that time now, let's fully start this. And yeah. the platform, um, that first of all is to show and share our recipes, share our knowledge in terms of like everything we've gathered together over the years. 
also being together, having that together, the background, you know, gives you so much more than just one person, obviously. As I said, together we are unstoppable. Um, and yeah, also building a platform and turning this whole tiki theme, like, you know, misunderstanding of like, uh, I just lost my words. Didn't I? I've got words. I've got so many words. I just yeah. have five. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, as I said, sort of like creating and sharing recipes. We want to create like an online recipe book that people can follow, but we'll have recipes of different levels of difficulty um, and not just twists on original tiki drinks from the 1930s and 40s and 50s, but also trying to come up with some formats that are a little bit unfamiliar to tiki. So, We'll be doing some stirred down drinks and going through that as well. Like a lot of other great tiki bars have started to attempt to deconstruct tiki drinks down to a more minimal format. I think I think just one uh, very important aspect is about this. So basically, if you go on your uh, on our Instagram or Facebook page, like we make it accessible for everyone. So if you're the fully geek and you want to read the whole history and why we came up with this drink and what the whole background is from the spirits we've chosen. Uh, yeah. we came up with the, this cocktail you can do this if you took a person from outside that literally gets into cocktails and like oh yeah, i really want to try this now you can see the recipe you can see the like the fully construction of how we make the syrups our tinctures and everything and i think this is something really important that we give all these options so it's accessible for everyone yeah also because i mean i know both of us have learned a lot from other bartenders, including Dean, who sat there right now, um, about sort of when you're going to prep home with ingredients, you go like one route and then it takes you a million other ways once you've mastered that. So you learn so much more quickly if you want to start doing this thing more seriously. If you just start taking, like, oh, I make this recipe and then I can apply the rules of making this recipe to this recipe and this recipe. And this recipe. So you just start sort of snowballing with it. That's sort of how I found another book as well. It's just like you try a Mai Tai, and there yeah. are a million different ways you can twist a Mai Tai. I mean, I mean, it's already <laughs> basically just an expanded daiquiri anyway. Yeah. That, that network is really fun. But also to use this, um, so we've got a number of sort of takeovers. I guess pencil it in at the moment is the most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> certain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You all know, um, so we're just sort of waiting to see when we'll be able to do those. But when we do, we want to try and link each one with um, a charitable cause that uh, is benefiting the heart of the Pacific or um, Caribbean restaurants that we're using predominantly on Haiti. So, actually, start to use Tiki to give back to the communities rather than just continually appropriate bits and pieces to form its own culture. Yeah, so this this has been obviously a, a, a big topic going on in the rum world at the moment because, you know, a lot of us uh, came through and, and discovered rum through tiki bars and and tiki bars, to, to give you a very brief overview for, for anyone watching who might not be familiar, um, the, the concept essentially started in 1934 with uh, Don the Beachcomber opening up uh, the Beachcomber's Cafe and, and, you know, evolved through there through Trader Vic um, and opening up his chain of restaurants and they sort of made these exotic drinks or as they later become known these tiki drinks and so sort of put rum on the map and they and they got people to escape and 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 at the time when they were first invented because this came out of california um this this whole movement essentially it was you know escapism it was it was a way for people to get out of bear in mind they've just finished uh you know 12 13 years of prohibition followed by the great depression like it wasn't a great time to be in america you couldn't really get away there wasn't the money to to go and travel and have these holidays and you had these guys creating this experience this idea um you know my, much like how i feel like we're, we're going to need to after lockdown you know like just, just imagine you're in a tropical place having a lovely time and then you're not here stuck at home um that's kind of kind of what it what it was you know it was like this idea of escapism and, and just as everyone now in in today's world is like oh i can't wait to get away and like 
imagining a time where we can just move around again freely it's like you know this this idea of having a bar you could go to no windows full like tropical experience or what you thought was a tropical experience because you know it was just a version of or an interpretation of it um it didn't have to be accurate back then it was just the idea of like you know this is a fantasy world that we're creating for you come and have drinks and flavors and cocktails and and experiences that that you know before that if you wanted a cocktail it was like bitters booze and sugar you know instead ice if you're lucky you know it's like, <laughs> suddenly you've got all these fruit juices and rums and different things from from tropical places far away and you know secret recipes and all of this stuff going on and it was this this wonderful wonderful idea but obviously as time has progressed and I, over the last you know 90 years since since the first tiki bars were popping up obviously now people are like well we've been to those places we we know what the culture you're pretending to be like actually is and you know there aren't naked hula girls dancing around with coconuts waiting to serve the white man and all of this kind of stuff it's like well maybe we should be more respectful to these actual cultures now we now we have a better idea of what it's from and you know yeah and just, this is like one of our like really important aspects that we want to show because like I don't agree. it is not our right like joe or my right to we've got a great deal of knowledge that's not the point but we are here to teach people about what it really is about and tell the real story we want to build a platform for these people to tell the real history, tell them, like tell the guys yeah. outside what's it all about. And um, I think with us having this opportunity, building that platform for those people, uh, you know, like. Yeah, we definitely don't like, obviously want to write people to tell them various stories of specific people, but um, we can definitely lend a platform that we build to people of that heritage to tell that story. In this, in the same way that Chucky and uh, Serge are doing the same thing as well. Obviously, Chucky has a much stronger indigenous person to watch with this uh, situation that we do as well. So, we've been following what they're doing. It's the same sort of thing. Really. Um, just Joe, 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 just to let you know, I think I think you you might need to be a little bit closer to the mic there. I know you guys are. It's it's tricky with the, with them. Um, the two sharing it, but just just let you know because some, some of that was was fading out a little bit. Can you just repeat the last last part you said? Sorry. Yeah, of course. So um, essentially, the part we said there was uh, we're not the right people to be telling the, Pacific, the various stories of the Pacific people, but uh, we would definitely love to lend our platform to people who are um, able to tell that story much better than us. And we've been appreciating it and following what Jockey's been doing with Jock Tales and with Team TV. And, and yeah. The vibe that she's putting out with this as well is really, really, really good stuff. That's it. We're super, we're super excited. We're we're going to be bringing Chucky over uh, from New York and and her cat Bacon. Uh, so we're just sorting out the plane tickets for them this week, and we're gonna we're gonna throw a big party when when the love the lovers are reunited of Serge and uh, Serge and Chucky together. So, so yeah, you know, it's and 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 this is exactly it. You know, it's like. You know, you uh, you you are doing everything that we we all can. You know, we're all white guys, like and white girls. It's like you know, like doesn't mean we don't love rum or we don't want to celebrate that platform. So I think, you know, absolutely, whenever we can we can give that platform and share it with with people, we do. Um, and yeah, you know, it's but it's such a good conversation to have because all of us were a product of this style of bar. And you know, all of us, all of us love the anchor trailer. <laughs> and and it's one more thing I wanted to say as well, like this is why it's so important with Chucky and Serge and us together and everyone else out there. Together we are stronger. Together we can achieve things. You know, like yeah. this is this is a very important message. So absolutely. No, absolutely. It's um, it's awesome. Then, Dean, you you get to visit probably more rum bars in the country than than anyone. Uh, <laughs> well, no, not not since March. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's true. <laughs> but um, 
what's 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 been your experience what what have you seen evolving what have you seen changing in rum bars and 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 what do you hope to see see carry on in the future well uh, not necessarily lump rum bars alone we've just seen well uh we've got the liars club which with was pretty much like is the, the trailer of the north i'm not sure linda would like me saying that but <laughs> it brought <laughs> uh, it brought a huge amount of love and attention to the rum world um uh, obviously the tropical drinks uh the, the sort of escapism and things like that i think the whole name came out the liars club because they used to tell the missus they're going out for one <laughs> so they called the bar the liars club which is incredible but in general just visiting bars across the country um not just rum bars you're seeing a lot more focus a lot more people having larger rum selections they're finally realizing that gin is not all it's cracked up to be <laughs> and replacing and you're seeing a lot more shelf space a lot more people um yeah rather than just buying uh you're seeing a lot more in say independent bottlers more niche things not just having a whole range of one particular brand yeah. uh, in tropical age you're seeing continental age you're seeing a lot more uh on it or white uh either aged 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 white rums or unaged <laughs> rums uh coming up as well uh which is another interesting point white rums are quite often aged as well tropically aged as well yeah yeah it just it's just across uh whether it be hotel bars rum bars or um just like cocktail bars or even whiskey bars you're seeing the odd people are moving more towards more to run uh, the more they understand it i spent most of my time in the last before I could travel outside of Reading, uh, doing category sessions, because everyone wanted to really swat up and get to know the differences between the islands and the different rules and regulations. So a lot of people don't understand that when they say Caribbean rum, everyone expects it to be the same, kind of like, oh yeah, it's rum from the Caribbean. It's made from sugar yeah. cane or molasses. When actual fact, each island will have its own rules, its regulations. Some rums have to be legally aged to actually call it rum. Uh, say Puerto Rico is so what one year, Cuba it's two. Uh, in 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 Australia, you have to have rum has to be aged to call it rum. So there's no Ray and Nephew in Australia, which is madness, <laughs> fucking nightmare. We had to smuggle it <laughs> from New Zealand. I mean, so, how could it <laughs> but, but this is the interesting thing. So you see, there there are companies that will do crowns with that, and they'll just take rum off the label. And with bigger brands, it's so well known that people just don't even like so a lot of the spice ones they don't even say rum on the label because they're they're not aged for two years and ray and nephew i respect them for it they were just like well we're not going to take rum off the label so no <laughs> um appa apparently they are now about to bring some in but i don't know what they're doing to the label or how they're getting around it or if they're going to do an aged expression or something but apparently some ray is ah nice who knows how but yeah australia is two two years minimum age in australia as well yeah and really interesting connection to that being is that like as people are like diversifying their rum, <coughs> they're able to construct a whole load more tea drinks because as we know, like you can blend various examples of rums from different islands and different regions in order to create a sort of flavor profile that neither none of them could achieve by themselves. Um, so it's really interesting to see a lot more, not even necessarily just rum bars, but like bars in general being able to play around mm. with sort of uh, concoctions. Yeah, and you're, that's, you're seeing a lot of uh, age, like lots of age rum, some tropically, some. Uh constantly aged rums sneaking their way into like whiskey whiskey vaults and things like that i've done a couple of sessions over a uh, whiskey club over soho whiskey club in bristol they've got the the whiskey vaults and they've got a, a whole load of rum in there and it's incredible to see and um, see what people people discovering that the sort of the complexities and uh, just the huge, huge diversity in the rum world whether it be well especially in aged and or un unaged rums it's amazing so it's that's amazing to see like rum, rum getting a lot more love than it deserves yeah. from, <laughs> from, pe from yeah. people that from drawing people in from different categories so you've got the people that like tequilas they're like oh i don't really drink rum then you'll give them something from one island whiskey drinkers uh obviously whiskey is usually the spirit matched with the mat maturation and the oak so a lot of the aged rums you can introduce it to them Yes, it's getting all angles. People are drawing 
they're finally seeing the light. <laughs> what we like to see, because I think it's really important in the whole industry, no matter where you're coming from, is it the rum side, is it the whiskey side, is it the key, tequila side? Like, you know, we're all in this together, and uh, it's great to support each other. Mm. Which also leads to things like cask swaps and stuff like exactly. that, which is key well, for well. um, like plantations, 98 Bayana, yeah. and Ocho Cask. Ocho Cask. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. And yeah. happen if you know, like you constantly go against each other. So. Mm. Well, yeah, it's a it's a, an interesting. I mean, yeah, there's there's many interesting aspects of the rum rum community itself, but also within the wider spirits category. And I think I think rum for for many years has been perceived as you know a lesser spirit of some degree to your whiskies and your cognacs and your other things. Um, and now you know, but for me, seeing not just not just here, and we're very grateful to be a part of whiskey show every day this week, but around the world you know whiskey festivals whiskey shows are, are, are coming up to rum producers being like actually can we can we have you join us we just want to mix it up a bit and have some have some other other spirits and other flavors going on and and it was always my favorite part if you were at a a, a real life whiskey show people would be going around all the stands and they'd be like rum Mm, okay well <laughs> back to you later or whatever and and a lot of them would a lot of them would like do do the little circuit all the whiskies they want to see and then they'd be like okay give me a rum then you know and you'd watch their face they try this rum and they'd be like oh what like and it was the first thing and after trying like 50 whiskies or whatever it's the first thing that just makes your whole palate explode and they're like oh wow and more often than not one of the rums there and, and often it would be like rums like diplomatica would just outsell completely all of the whiskies there and they couldn't understand it and they were like but the rum was the one they remembered because it stood out from the this, from the I mean, other ones they'd had this may yeah. sound really funny but this is what people do all over the world i remember i back in back home i went to lots of festivals and we used to have these like big rock concerts uh festivals there literally was just rock but then after the years they like started to introduce like just one hip-hop um scene and you know, whatever like people are like what i'm not i'm i'm a rocker i'm not gonna listen to hip-hop and uh, you know so somehow the same reaction but then afterwards it, it was there i mean yeah. you know the option like of course you can walk away but you can still see it or hear it and you know this is how you yeah sneakily introduce people to you to other people. <laughs> yeah i've done lots of lots of whiskey shows like or more more regional ones over the past few years and obviously the people are there they've paid for the whiskey it's, it's, it's like a whiskey lounge for example or something like that uh and my stand would be empty for the first half hour hour and the people were like oh look at you oh we'll come over later and i was like yeah you will do don't i'm worried <laughs> but yeah, i'll be flooded <laughs> i'm here to play the long game <laughs> it always paid off yeah. that's why i always hit whiskey shows early and find the rum guys <laughs> there's no one up there yeah, yeah. <laughs> the time <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And 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 this is it. And I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, a whiskey lover isn't isn't just a whiskey lover because they they love whiskey. They 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 love good spirits, they love good quality. And the shame of it is, and, and Dean, obviously you're saying this is changing, which is which is great, but like a, in a lot of places around the world, you walk into a, a, a bar with a great back bar, two hundred bottles in the back bar, and maybe 100 150 of them are whiskey maybe 30 of them are gin maybe 10 are vodkas why would you have 10 vodkas i don't know and then you have like, <laughs> you have like five shitty rums in the corner and it's it's like it's like they never go oh let's have the five best rums that money can buy it's like no they're like let's get the five yeah. nastiest cheapest shit that no, no one will ever want to drink on their own no one will ever want to like have a neat oh, may I have a, a little neat sip of that uh, curiously coloured spiced uh, tropical <laughs> something. You're like, 
what? No, of course they're not rum drinkers because you're giving them shit. So if we give them good quality, if we give them great options, that's how we get them. And 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 it needs passionate bartenders, obviously, to, to recommend it and put those forward. But um, yeah, having having the selection there in the first place is half the battle. And and Dean, you've been fighting this fight for a good a good long time. So thank you. Thank you for making the no. UK rum selection better. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's I, I love introducing like people's face, especially um, say the last couple of years at the the, the physical whiskey show and you get to see people's just their face change and be like oh yeah 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 and you can't explain what it is and they're like oh yeah 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 oh yeah and then take that first sip and they kind of their eyes light up <laughs> like what some people are a little bit confused like they've had their first oyster you know they're like mm. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is this <laughs> but i like it and then they keep going back and back yeah, yeah. <laughs> This, yeah, I mean, this, this is the joy of, of our job and like this what makes me sounds a bit crazy when I say that but this is you know this keeps me going in terms of like sharing the knowledge and you know keep transferring people into like this is what you don't know yet like this is mm -hmm. tried it <laughs> and yeah <laughs> yeah this is what keeps my heart beating so <laughs> So um, uh, we've got Brian from Phoenix in Arizona who said he used to do wine fests in Chicago uh, and you're at the whiskey stand. Uh, uh, oh, your stand at the last. They were already buzzed already when they were coming to you. So I think Brian's saying the more wasted they are, the easier a sad is. <laughs> we'll take what we can get, Brian, you know. Uh, <laughs> We're not we're not picky and choosy in the run world. Everyone's welcome. <laughs> but anyway, it's the contrary, right? Because they could destroy their palate all day, all day with PTI cookies, <laughs> and they're coming to you, and you're still managing to get them to recognise something, which means if they tried that first, they probably wouldn't even have bothered with everything else. There's so much there going on. Joe's <laughs> not giving up on that fight. I like it. <laughs> never, never. So, okay, so let's look at um, let's look at sippers first. But if you were going to recommend, if you were going to try and tempt a whiskey drinker away and and into the into the light of the rum world, um, what would be two or three rums that you would recommend? Maybe uh, Anya, if you want to start, what, what would be the two two or three rums that you you would try to woo a whiskey lover with? First of all. Ah, woo, sorry, great. Woo, woo. Um, I mean, you know, once again, that really depends of like what this person is like has been drinking before. So obviously, I will actually question them, like, like what whiskeys you're like really into, like what's your favourite side and everything. Um, but if I just would blindly pick, and not knowing what this person before was drinking, it's definitely one of the ones. Plantation five years old, yeah. is, uh, as we love to call it, it's face juice. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, going straight into another one is English Harbour. Yeah, English Harbour, like I've discovered in my years being behind the bar and having it at home for people they never really tried rums or go, coming from whiskey aspects or other sides, like always really loved it. Like I think I've never had people going against it and like having a bad comment about it and um yeah what would be the last thing i think yeah so many to choose from right <laughs> i mean like one of one of my absolute favorites dean talking to you is uh is veritas uh, and i really like introducing people to daiquiris of that um because it's just you know the explosion like everything is just amazing like, they obviously been drinking maybe daiquiris before but they had either havana daiquiris or like bacardi daiquiris or whatever and we all know they taste completely different yeah. so me then having you know the opportunity to be like oh have you, have you tried this before uh, and make them a very tasty daiquiri and they always like them so uh, 
Amazing. And this wasn't pre-planned, by the way. This is completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, <that's Anna. laughs> yeah, well, it, and you just make sure you uh, um, bottles in the post. Don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> and the Venmo. Uh, the and the, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, and how easy it is to share something and to show love for something if it's a great product. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And it, isn't it amazing how many people? have not experienced a proper daiquiri in their lives oh, and you're yes. like, <laughs> oh oh no, they're, no they're strawberries like, <laughs> i mean don't get me wrong i love <laughs> strawberry daiquiris <laughs> yeah. but <laughs> but very very rarely will you get one made with real strawberries so. oh yeah <laughs> it's never even never even seen a strawberry in his life but um but no a proper a proper daiquiri uh <laughs> chris says i believe that was my request last time i was at his <laughs> yes it was chris and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> using like like all these like chris uh so my friend chris in Amsterdam has this like wild range of just like crazy rums and we're just like Ah uh, yes, yeah, a little DOK, a little Claren, a little this, a little that, a little that. Strawberries, daiquiri, done. <laughs> <laughs> the best daiquiri stand for I've ever had was with the four sites Worthy Park as well. Just like it's, it's absolutely incredible. So much worth it uh, putting a big bowl of rum in a, in a drink that normally doesn't have it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, it's just it's just beautiful, and it's it's. And this is the thing, and, and this this one of the things I love about rum is that we don't have that connotation other spirits have. It's like, you're putting it in a cocktail? How dare you? Like, yeah. how dare you fucking, like, no, you drink that neat. That's the only thing you're allowed to do. It. And, and it's interesting because in the whiskey world, in the whiskey world, once you go up past about, I don't know what the equivalent price, but past, like, say, 10 pounds a shot or 10 pounds a nip for something in the whiskey, straight away it's like it's an offense you know it's like absolutely not whereas in the rum world it's like i i reckon i reckon that last consignment would taste good in a a (laughs) maybe we should try it (laughs) let's just see let's just let's just make sure you know (laughs) what is what is the most lavish drink you put uh, last consignment in So is, it, is, not, is this not the platform to put it? <laughs> I, you know, we, we, we try. Um, I made a rum flip with uh, Black Top Finest Caribbean, um, mm. which was equal parts Black Top Finest Caribbean and Green Chartreuse. Uh, 10 mils Mr. Black, I think 5 mils Demerara syrup. For the whole, 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 whole leg shaken up um obviously a little nutmeg and it was absolutely delicious and we tried it with last consignment and the last consignment because because as you know it's just like boom it just like wiped out all the <laughs> <laughs> and we were all like oh well, the Pirates caribbean was better and now we're yeah. shot of last consignment <laughs> So that was a disappointing end to that one. Um, I think I can't. I I feel like we may have made a daiquiri with last consignment with Chris, but I can't remember uh, which is. But then I of, often can't remember what drinks I've made uh, made over there. So um, same question to Dean about Hand and Great House. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. What's the most lavish cocktail you put that in? <laughs> Um, what's the, no, I just made a just an old fashioned really with a pineapple syrup. <laughs> Nothing. I didn't go overly mad with that, unfortunately. <laughs> it sold out too quickly. Um, I couldn't yeah. get so much. <laughs> I think yeah. we have a question from Brian. Yeah. Uh, so, do the big houses produce within their expressions the same quality as? the boutique expressions uh you might have to clarify that for me brian just what what the difference is you mean there um is there a guide to regionality that exists to read about on the web um one of my favorite rum resources so it'd be great to hear from all you guys but um cocktailwonk.com is usually the first place i'll go to check anything on rum regionality or or rules or random geeky separations because um uh because yeah Matt, Matt Petrick, the writer there, is uh, 
uh, one an incredible writer but two his whole his whole life has been like writing technical manuals in in it and things for people who knew nothing about it and bring them from zero to hero and now he's just doing the same in the run world so if you want to understand like ester marks and funks or the differences between agrico and and uh clarins and cachaca like he's taken all of these weird obtuse questions which come up in the run world and just pretty much written something on on most of them so um so that that's a great run resource anyway to to go and check out um it says appleton versus bacardi uh so as in Bic quite. well i mean they're both the i mean those are examples of both two quite big houses but i guess is is the question did they produce like smaller boutique expressions within their range um well i i guess it's fair to say both of both of those examples do you know appleton has their appleton joy which is probably my favorite uh of of all the appletons that have come out they're amazing if you've got you know money to burn but it's amazing <laughs> it's like a 25 year old uh jamaican appleton blend that that Joy's released. Beautiful Bacardi has their Facundo range now and some some have really sort of leaned into those high-end ones. Um versus uh plantation or Jamaican. So I'm 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 not sure exactly on that, but I, we're gonna run with it. And and Brian, you keep you keep sort of just add some more notes in there and we'll try and answer it explicitly for you. Um long pond size well, so plantation, plantation are a house a cognac house based in based in cognac obviously a cognac mm. house. um uh, and they uh they've got they own a couple of well they own a distillery they know some shares in jamaican's distillery and they release bottle bottlings from again the independent bottlers they work with distilleries and brokers across the world and then they take back so they've got a huge amount of different releases they do every year one of which is actually long pond i believe but they always mm. They finish it for a year or so um, in cognac, or maybe maybe longer. You guys, jo Joe and Annie, will be able to tell a little bit more about the, the finer details. But in a, in a nutshell, that's what Plantation do. Uh, so they're very good in their transparency as well on their local their bottlings. So the Long Pond, it would say the amount of years aged at Long Pond or in Jamaica, and then the amount of years in cognac. So they're again full transparency. But Plantation do Jamaican, they do Asian style, Barbadian style rum. PG and you name it, some yeah, uh, countries in Central South America, they've probably bottled as well. <laughs> yeah, an ongoing list uh, and yeah, like special releases in each category as well. It's literally an ongoing thing and uh, yeah, mm. it's a huge, huge palette for you to pick from. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Right, okay. <laughs> so, right, gotcha. So, so clarified in the whiskey world, so a Diageo versus a Corcoman. So I guess, you know, big big corporates versus versus yeah. smaller independents and what yeah. they can doing. Is he, which one is he referring to as the big corporate from jamaica you're asking about plantation being big bottom uh, i think it's uh appleton and bacardi big 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 yeah. um, national a good band certainly other jamaican distilleries are and definitely making boutique offerings at the moment as well i mean why the barkley and lots of very nice finishes that can yeah. just start getting their run I'm just definitely going, uh, going strong as well. So, yeah, a good one would be like Worthy Park and Appleton, really. That'd be a good comparison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two very, um, well, one more known within the sort of, uh, say, say Worthy Park is more of the Kilhoman in this sort of uh, story yeah. <laughs> yeah. analogy. Uh, and then you've got Appleton would be the, the bigger multinational. I may uh, say something about Kilhoman because, um, like, back in Switzerland, I worked with Kilhoman like pretty closely together and um like for them being like as i say like a smaller uh, thing and not you know that open to the world yet um i think it's pretty amazing because they also like so every year they have their special releases so they have their flagships but then also every year they release a, a new bottle from that flagship going on and uh, yeah i mean as i say they've taken definitely like a couple of the big boys uh, out there and i think sometimes it's maybe not that bad that not that many people know about it yet so you know it's, it's better for you to more, grab more to grab, to grab the real bottles yeah. uh, the amazing, the amazing 
things to taste out so so it's always that duality it's like the prices of of rum compared to whiskey you know it's like exactly. but say yeah. i feel someone has like really really good prices i mean yeah, really yeah. absolutely amazing liquids um and I think similar to similar to the uh, sort of the Scotch, uh, the uh, whiskey world as well. If you've got a smaller, uh, a bigger company, say Appleton, for example, uh, Chris has pointed out they are owned by Campari. Um, they release they have a core range, and then every now and again they will release something big and really exciting, like Joy, which came out maybe two years ago. Yeah. They've vamped, say, that eight year. Uh, whereas a smaller distillery like Kilcommon, like uh, Worthy Park, they can be a bit more agile on their releases, and they come a bit they're younger. Um, they, they have the ability to sort of move a little bit quicker, plan some new, fresher releases. So they come a bit thicker and faster than the younger, like Kilhoman. They've got their yearly range. They've got their 100% Isla. Uh, I visited Kilhoman a couple of years ago, so I know quite a bit about it. <laughs> yeah, Great place to visit. Very different island to Jamaica, but um, <laughs> a bit, bit windier in my experience. Um, but yeah, if you... I think big companies will still release really exciting things, but not as often. That's and that's that's a really good point. I think you've summed that up perfectly, Dean. It's like there is there is nothing that stops these big houses creating absolutely phenomenal rums. And to be fair, they've got the resources and the the stocks and the casks and everything to, you know, release the the, the best stuff in the world if they if they chose to. It's um but I guess, you know, whereas for a, for a smaller producer releasing a single cask of maybe a couple of hundred bottles and doing that on a global scale and it being like a really exciting thing for, for 200 rum nerds to get into um, doesn't have the same attraction for, you know, some yeah. super big house. It's like, well, unless we can make, unless we can make, you know, minimum five, maybe 10,000 bottles of it, then we're not going to do it at all because it's just not even worth our while to come up with the bottle and the label and everything else. Whereas a, a smaller producer is more likely to lean into those, those kind of things. So um, I, I had an, ex, uh, an experience at the Fiji distillery, um, which kind of really opened my eyes to this because in, in Australia, Fiji, Fiji rum is everywhere in Australia. Like they flooded the market with, with Fiji rum um, and the Fiji distillery is open, uh, is owned by, coca-cola amatil so it's like couldn't get much of a bigger company to <laughs> fiji distillery um but the head distiller at the fiji distillery is this um uh, guy liam costello he came from australia i think he came from the bean lee distillery i think originally in australia and came over to fiji to run that now the fiji distillery has only been running for 35 years so in the grand history of rum it's a very very young island for rum but they've got a tremendous amount of sugarcane there um they can make all their own molasses they can and they make you know they make beautiful rum but most of the rum i had tried was not that great i was just like <laughs> well, it's stock standard it's whatever um and at the time when I, I was working for plantation we were about to bring out our first like fiji vintage and we were going over there to check it out and i was like not sure i haven't had like i hadn't had a fiji rum that wowed me at that stage you know i was like i'm i'm, I'm just not sure then we went to the distillery and liam like lined up all of the rums he made and all of the stuff from the casks he had kicking around and he was like here's a here's a 15 year old and a 17 year old cask which i've got just sitting here and i was like why don't you release that he's like well it's only one cask and they, you know, Coca-Cola have no interest in releasing this one cask. So, and we don't have any other way to get it out there. So I just drink it. And I was like, well, can we buy the cask? Can we, can we have that one? And, and it was, it was such a, it was, it was, it was an eye opening moment for me because so often we judge what a country makes by a particular brand or a particular release. And, Sometimes that's done because, you know, they know it will sell well because they, they've got to hit a certain price point or it doesn't make sense to release one cask of really expensive rum, um, even though it would be great, but 
they might not have anyone to sell it to or they don't have the market for it yet you know so um so yeah it was it was an eye opener to me all of these distilleries no matter no matter what you think about a brand or a distillery or they're too big or whatever they are it's like no they really know what they're doing they can all make incredible things you just might never get to actually try them because yeah. it might not be a, a marketing a, a marketable thing for them at the moment you know so and also so, quite, of, quite often as well if you're a larger brand you're going to have your uh, your specific flavor profiles so if a yeah. casks a broke casks come out and they're like well that won't fit that's where the smaller companies the independent bottlers the independent bottlers can come in like, that's so interesting this bigger company yeah. has no use for it really as you say it's like one two casks that's so like and then not abnormally but it still is absolutely delicious that's when that they can kind of sweep in and release it on a much smaller scale something yeah. a, bit, a bit left field it's so, it's so odd to think isn't it imagine imagine like getting a cask of rum being like this is incredible <laughs> but it tastes too different no yeah well, yeah what <laughs> but it happens it happens all the time and it's like yeah and 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 I, I think there are some more hidden treasures in the rum world because coming back to what we were talking about at the start because they're not always 100 percent aged in origin because a lot of them are sent out quite young and if they're not sold straight away that cask will carry on aging wherever it's wherever it is and you do, you, sometimes you don't know what it's going to become, you know, sometimes you think, oh, it's just a standard rum, and then it just turns into this wonderful swan at the end of yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> How poetic, lovely. <laughs> That's that's what that's what these independent bottlers are doing, right? Yeah, I, I thought he's I thought he's going to go more tropical than a swan. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful flamingo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I think you're going to go butterfly. You know, caterpillar. Yeah. Sort of, that, 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 that become the most beautiful butterfly, but it might be underground somewhere for thirty years. Mm. It's still it's still early on a Tuesday, all right? <laughs> 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 No, um, uh, so so carrying on, um, uh, what 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 rums would you woo a whiskey lover with, uh, Joe? What would you what would you woo them over to our side with? Uh, Real McCoy, twelve year old, is okay. stunning. So so accessible for pretty much everyone, bourbon or scotch alike. It's not sweet, but it presents a sort of sweet profile. Oh, it's yeah. so Sweet profile that like bourbon does. I think that's a really banging one. And for the price point, it's pretty really damn incredible. They and rum. Um, I would obviously say check out the exceptional cask range from Foursquare and uh, yeah. newer releases coming out of Mountgate as well. That have been really interesting. And both will have a lot of appeal to whiskey drinkers. Outside of that, some of the third party bottlers are active in like Guyana, as long as you're not talking huge, huge amounts of money, but like. Some of the Duncan Taylor releases have been really, really good and have a lot of parallels with continental Asian whiskies as well from Scotland. So, good shouts. Yeah. Yeah. Some um, of those Duncan Taylor demo releases are fantastic. Yeah. They're they incredible. are absolutely banging. Um, actually, on, you know, Bristol, Bristol Rumco as well have some really incredible demo areas that come up, pop up every once in a while. Look much more rich flavors that are sort of like, what the non-educated rum consumer might think of most traditionally associated with rum, like that stone fruit, heavy raisin, rum and raisin ice cream I mentioned earlier, mm. that kind of thing that pops out quite quickly. Um, yeah, rum bar, because Serge was here earlier, and also <laughs> rum bar, mighty park. Um, pretty much everything that comes out at the minute has been very relatable to this weekend as well, especially. Looking at like big bulk space sites and also some of the islands to jack yeah. and good price points. So. Yeah, absolutely. And Dean, for you, you must. I feel like feel like you'd spend a lot of your time converting converting. Yeah, products. What, I've had what like pleasantly idea? surprised considering um, uh, agricole in general, even with some of the rum world. So agricole, for those who don't know, is made from the pure sugarcane juice. So it's like the, you can actually taste the crop itself. So it's a lot fresher um, uh, as opposed to molasses, which you can make all year round. Uh, 
very different flavor. Even some people in the rum world do, don't quite get it because it's basically the British culture. If you look at the rums that were brought into Britain, it's usually been quite heavy demerara, quite heavily caramelled, or on the other end of the scale, your much lighter rums like Bacardi and Havana. They're the huge, huge brands uh, which yeah. it, we're, we're used to drinking over. Uh, but in France, they because Martinique is part of France, they drink an awful lot of that. So I actually took it as an experiment, the VSOP. So a uh, very special purpose between four and 10 years old. And just because of the cask management, as soon as you say, oh, it's ex-cognac, ex-bourbon, fresh American oak. And just because of the cask management, it just really, people's ears pricked up like, huh, let me try this. And usually yeah. it's not something you'd say. Uh, and it went down so, so well and converted huge, huge amounts of people. Again, it's got those stone fruits. It's got that sort of, beautiful sort of French balance like cognacs have that beautiful balance from blending uh that works surprisingly well actually for a VSOP yeah actually I, I rum the paz VSOP as well and um, but both of them like mm -hmm. is that grassiness is also a direct equivalent of grain the basic notes that provide by grains so you've got the yeah. root Whiskey is very much similar to the rum in terms of flavor. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing aggressive. More sort of, you know, if you're going to put it to a regionality, which I know some people don't like, but uh, to, towards like Space ID or American whiskey, it's got that sort of lovely sweet spot where you can taste the grain or the grass in this case and, and the oak management. But yeah, VSOP and the plug my brand is at Hamden as well. Hamden, just because it's got that big, bold, big botanic black piece, you know, it just really, really transfers well from the if uh, if you like your big big heavy malts <laughs> yeah that's uh, that's exa exactly going to be my focus with uh with old billy abbott tomorrow when we yeah try to find him a run for uh, an ipa junkie yes yeah. <laughs> nice <laughs> um but yeah i i think you know this uh the, and there's some amazing recommendations there i think that finding those parallels, finding those bridges between the the spirit they already love to to what they could love in the rum world is is so important, you know, and, and you know, uh, like Joe, you mentioned, you know, Real McCoy 12 for a bourbon lover and, you know, Hampton Dean for a, a, a bigger flavour lover, you know, and, and I, I, I think we often see esters in the rum world being used almost as an analogy for PPM in the Isla whiskey world, yeah. you know. Those, also, those... I, should, I, should, I should mention as well, Mount Gay, if you're going to look for a sort of big name oh, yeah. you can pick up at the supermarket, Mount Gay Eclipse or their XO, their XO is absolutely fantastic. Again, yeah. let's put price points like mid thirties, 40 quid. It's fantastic. Can't go. Yeah, some beautiful, beautiful rums out there. And, um, and yeah, we just, we just need to taste them. Yeah. Chris says black top, black top's pretty great too. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, they'll, just the one we're all drinking. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Didn't even pay them for that one. Okay. I'll, I'll get you <laughs> um, um, Brian asks, is there a way to, to see or see versus taste the different rums? By location say like a wester hall versus west indies versus st james from martinique um yeah come to one of dean's trainings uh, <laughs> we just need to fly to the uk you can yeah. try <laughs> together <laughs> or or go or to fly me to arizona yeah i'll happy to do so <laughs> yeah 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 if you fly us to arizona we'll come and do it for you <laughs> um or go to chris's house in amsterdam uh or go to trailer happiness or just yeah it's finding these places and, and this is so much of it isn't it is the exposure to these tastings you know and, and this is another thing that we've been talking about all week where it's like we can go onto the bartender exchange today we'll, we'll probably find well maybe not right now because everything is um is closed but um but normally you'd be able to find thousands of whiskey trainings hundreds of gins trainings and maybe a handful of rum trainings throughout the year um and and you know it's it's limited you know we we don't have the same same vastness that some of the other categories have so for us you know one of the things that i'm really passionate about i know dean is i know Anya and joe are as well as like the education side of rum if we can if we can i know if i can just get you to taste the rum if i can just explain what this this is in your glass then you're gonna you're gonna fall in love with rum you're gonna have an experience you're gonna be 
you know transported you're going to have you're going to have a time with it that um you know you might not have with another spirit you know <laughs> being transported to scotland is not quite the same as being transported to <laughs> Maybe, uh, it's lovely don't get me wrong it's nice but it's not quite the same you don't have rihanna walking <laughs> on the beach there you know um <laughs> but it, it is it's a different experience and there's a there's a this is for me what made me fall in love with rum was there was a, a a passion to it and excitement to it you know you go to a rum bar it is different to going into a whiskey bar you know you you go to trailer and they're breathing fire along the copper roof and like sending ray and nephew fireballs across the room and the whole room's dancing i know it's not allowed anymore but it's still a wonderful thing in it and it's like <laughs> don't see that in a whiskey bar do you don't go to a whiskey bar like excuse me sir i'm just gonna blow some car strength whiskey across the room one moment in their waistcoats and garters and all that you know it's <laughs> rum, rum rum has a magic to it that i don't believe any other spirit quite has you know and, and for, for me it's so exciting to be a part of this 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 what is a, a little bubble com compared to compared to some of the other spirits and and right now it's such an exciting time to get into rum because you've got so many wonderful expressions so many incredible things coming from these distilleries and it's and it's still really affordable it hasn't hit that mainstreamness that that whiskey has yet it hasn't got that like let's just add another few hundred pounds onto the price tag because of what it is you know and like there are some bargains out there. Um, even even now, it's such a wonderful time to build a rum selection. It really, really is. So, and in general, um, as we said it, with the with, it's like we are just generally better dressed. You know, we drink more color. <laughs> <laughs> more color. Obviously, obviously, the fashion far <laughs> out the cognac and the whiskey world. You know. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh, <laughs> no it's um no and and you know we we bring a little we bring it i feel like we bring a little excitement into their lives you know <laughs> so <laughs> mayface is here hey mayface we, uh, mayface and i did a wonderful run 101 yesterday um and uh hey <laughs> mayface uh, says her flatmates love all her shirts well yes because mayface's flatmates are the ultimate party crew for lockdown um, they, um if anyone's been following mayface's instagram you you if you've been wondering how to do lockdown right just go and follow mayface and you'll, you'll see how it's done uh, inspired a global uh, marketing campaign for Bacardi on how to party at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so pretty, yeah. yeah, pretty major stuff. Like that guy that like set fire to his house. Was it Project X? The film they made about that guy that held the best ever house party. <laughs> I no, but I feel like this is a direct challenge for me. What What did he do? Of tiki going into one of those house parties, you never know where fire breathing goes at four o'clock in the morning. Exactly. When everyone's... Yeah, you need a copper ceiling, mm. <laughs> <laughs> stick outside. to the garden. Yeah, can you find brief Dean? Yeah, uh, yeah, awesome. Can't grow a so there's no fear, fear of setting that up either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Mitch. Uh, yeah, so I once um, I once did, there was this, they had this uh, event after one of the whiskey shows called Whiskey Wars, and they had five whiskey ambassadors next to each other, and it was like a night where, you know, ambassadors are always nice to each other. This night was like, no, we're just going to slag each other off. We're going to so like... a lot of smack talk, yes. Yeah, just like, just like passing the mic along and just every brand dissing the other brand. And I was like, please let me be a part. I know I'm not a whiskey, but just let me be a part of this. And they were like, okay, we'll let the rum rum person in as well. So all the whiskey guys went up. And then I went up with rum. And I was like, well, this will be very easy because it's rum. <laughs> <laughs> and I start telling the story. I start telling about trailer and, and breathing out the fire and, and all of this stuff. And this guy goes, prove it. <laughs> I'm like, 
um, we're like inside in Canberra in Australia in this like like very closed space full of a lot of people. And he's like, yeah, prove it. And I'm like, oh, I don't think I don't think the bar would necessarily want me to breathe fire in here because there's a lot of fire extinguishers and a lot of wood and a lot of flammable things and people. And he's like, yeah, they would. I'm I'm the owner of the bar. Prove it. <laughs> <laughs> so I grabbed a bottle of uh, Plantation the OFTD, 69%. I'm like, all right. I'm like, let's stand back. <laughs> <laughs> did the layback, did the hand, set on fire, launched this fireball, and the whole room goes, woo! <laughs> and all the whiskey guys go, oh, no. And then they were like, okay, place your vote, votes for who wins. The <laughs> and so the speaker was like, shit, rum's going to win. So like, <laughs> it's like, just goes, okay, before you vote, let's just have a recap. Let's talk about whiskey again. And like, gets people. <laughs> so um, I claim, I came a close second in the end. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Robbed. Was, robbed. It was, yeah. yeah it was, Definitely, they were like, and afterwards the speed came up. He was like, I had to, I had to fix that. We couldn't have rum actually win the whiskey awards because it would be an outrage. Today, rum always wins. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. But um, but yeah, uh, well, I think um, uh, I think uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful place to to wrap it up. Is there anything else you would like to add, uh, or or any passing words of wisdom that you'd like to leave uh, leave our wonderful viewers with? Um, well, like the tropical continent, I think let's start aging some like, Cuban rums on the continent, rums or other not necessarily oh. Cuban, but rums that the distillate is not necessarily powerful enough by itself to stand up to that long in a barrel in a tropical environment before the wood overtakes it. So maybe those are the rums that need to start making their way to the continent and, and having a, a long aging period there instead and see how that turns out. Because we've talked exclusively about like Hamden and Guyanese rums and like those rums can definitely master the power mm-hmm. of 30 yeah. years in the top. We, we know, we know fine. that. Like there's nothing that's going to beat those, but yeah. maybe some of the more column still lighter ones need to try it out and see how it goes. It's a good point. It'd be really interesting to try. We'll, um, we'll let Mamie know. <laughs> Just in general, I mean, you know, because as I say, I'm like the fairy sprinkling the dust. Uh, let's just appreciate each other. And as I say, together we are stronger. So. I'm all out. Dean, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm all out. <laughs> I'm all out. <laughs> well, what are you I've got a team meeting in 20 minutes. It's going to be interesting. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and Dean, any words of wisdom to, to leave um, us with? Just get out there and discover more, really. That's the only way you can discover more of a category is by drinking and sampling more of it. <laughs> Absolutely. No, yeah. it's, it's so important. It's, um, yeah, uh, the, the more the more master classes, the more tastings, and, and so many of them are free. Just like speak to your local rum bars, ask them when they're going to do a rum tasting next, ask them when they're going to do something. Um, if you're in London, 2nd of November, Trailer Happiness, we're going to do uh, a black top tasting there. So please uh, come along and um, invite your friends. So. And uh, Brian, if you're still there, definitely check out like apparently Hula's Modern Tiki Uptown and Undertow in Phoenix, uh, offering decent selections of rum. So just go and like see them and see if they can add you the flight. And like Dean says, try them all, make your own mind up. They're, they're, every virtually every release has been reviewed by very knowledgeable people online as well. So if you find the exact name of rum you got in your glass, put it into the internet. Someone will have wise words to say about it. Exactly. There is fat rum pirate or one of these little guys, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I can't wait to come and visit Brian. We'll uh, we'll bring you all of the rum. So, cheers, everyone. Thank you so much for a wonderful cheers, session. Cheers. We'll see you all again tomorrow. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao. See you later. Bye. Mwah. <laughs>